As I say, I'm delighted to welcome Peter to uh, to uh, deliver this session. Uh, I've worked with Peter for many years now, so he's a friend and colleague of mine. Um, and we've worked together on uh, various different uh, culture change opportunities. Um, and I know Peter brings a, a wealth of experience in uh, working with different sorts of organizations as they, uh, uh, I guess, grapple with the challenges of trying to shift their culture in order to deliver their strategy. Uh, so, Peter, I'm looking forward to the session um, and uh, happy to be supporting you in it. And uh, I will hand across to you. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, welcome to everyone, particularly friends from the UK and some uh, colleagues and past clients, uh, friends from America, various parts of Europe. Um, it's great to have you all online. It's very useful to have people put their names that I can make sure that uh, I, I don't use examples from any of uh, my clients who are online from their organization. Um, we will be sharing a few examples, but today I'm delighted to be talking about culture change. It's a subject I've been engaged with for many years. I think I've been researching organizational culture change for um, over 40 years and over 35 years uh, helping large organizations develop and change their culture. Some of that with Chris Smith, as he mentioned, with several uh, major clients, um, some with GP strategies quite recently. So welcome. We'll try and cover today you know, what is organization culture, which is um, often a, a mystique. We'll look at where does culture reside? How does culture help your organization and how does it block and limit your organization? And then the really important topic about how can you develop or evolve your culture to deliver its strategy? So. Um, just let's do a quick recap on, on what we talked about last time. For those of you who may not have seen the slides, which Chris said are now available if you also want to go back and look at those. We talked about being a purpose-led organization, and we set that in the context of my favorite formula. If an organization is not learning and adapting faster than the environment is changing, it's on the Darwinian road to extinction. Arguably, the ability to learn, adapt, and evolve, not just what's going on in the world, learning about it, but evolve your strategy, evolve your culture, evolve your leadership to be fit for that changing environment. That is the only competitive advantage that we believe is still around in the world. Your products, your processes can all be copied. But that agility and adaptability and, and to co-evolve with a changing ecosystem is critical. So last time we talked about how to be purpose-led means that we have to have and align our strategy, our culture, and our leadership. And what we know is the world is changing faster and faster. Strategizing becomes a weekly, if not a daily occurrence. It's not something we do once every five years, which was the uh, standard practice when I was first a manager and a leader. But we also know that it's far easier to evolve your strategy than it is to evolve your culture. And in the, in the, the famous words of Peter Drucker, culture will always eat your strategy for breakfast. And we'll touch on the subject of the third of these webinars that will happen in May, how do you evolve the leadership culture to develop the organizational culture to deliver the strategy to meet the changing worlds of tomorrow. So, oh, skip two slides there. So if we just go back, what we know is that culture changes dynamically in relationship to its environment. Culture isn't something locked away inside the organization. It exists in, in your lived brand, the way you engage with all your stakeholders. It exists in how your organization is perceived. And we'll look at how do we think about co-evolution of your ecosystem constantly changing and your internal organizational culture constantly changing. So we looked at how purpose-driven organizations are essential for the 21st century. And last time we talked about, a bit about how do you alight upon that purpose and how do you get that something that's co-created and shared by all. 
we gave some definitions of what, what, what is a company's purpose. And you'll see on the left, my own definition, a mission and, uh, captures the company's ambition. A vision shows what it will be like when success is achieved, but purpose defines who the company serves and the value it creates for them. So today we'll be looking at how do you get a culture that feels part of that collective service, part of the collective purpose? And how does the, the sense of purpose become a North Star for everything that happens within the organization? We talked last time about what are the outcomes of a purpose, and we gave lots of evidence about why purpose-driven organizations are more successful than ones that are not purpose-driven, that are short-term target-driven. And today we're going to go on to look at if we have a purpose-driven organization, that is an organization that's trying to create shared value, which you'll see at the head of the arrow, for all its stakeholders, its customers, its investors, its suppliers and partner organizations, its employees, the communities in which it operates and is located, and also the ecology or more than human environment. But to actually shift that shared value, we're also looking at how do we shift stakeholder and public perceptions of what we're doing? How do they view us? How do they partner with us? How do they feel part of us? And increasingly organizations are employing less people internally but having to partner with more people externally to be successful. To shift those stakeholder perceptions, we have to shift those moments of truth, the thousands of customer and stakeholder engagement that happen every day in our organizations, where the culture is lived and experienced and perceptions are formed. This we call the lived brand as opposed to the espoused brand of the organization. And what we know is that if you really want to shift your lived brand, how your people at all levels of the organization engage customers, engage patients for those of you who I see have joined from the NHS, engage students for those who have joined from the universities I see on, on the list, if we want to shift how those people are engaged by our frontline staff, the thing that most drives the quality of that engagement is how those frontline staff are treated by their direct line manager. And what we also know from the research is how managers treat their employees is not most affected by being sent on better management courses or customer centered customer-centric courses, it's most affected by how those frontline managers are managed by their leaders. So really, if we really want to be purpose-led, we've got to get real integration right along this value chain, looking at how the, the world of tomorrow and how our stakeholders, what they're going to need from us. And how does that mean we have to align uh, the perception we want to create the customer experience we want to create. And to do that, how do we need to shift our organizational culture? And to shift our organizational culture, how do we shift our leadership culture? So we start future back and outside in, but our development and our change and transformation has to start inside out. So let me just say we will be pausing halfway through to take questions. So do feel free at any moment that things occur to you to put questions in the chat box. And we'll, um, Chris will start collecting those up and I'll engage with those about halfway through and then again five minutes before the end. So over the 35 to 40 years we've been working with culture, we've gradually evolved this model of the five levels of culture. So think about how does culture show up and where does it reside? Often people say to me, oh, well, culture is how things are done around here. Culture resides in the people. But what we're going to be showing you today is that 
you could change all the people. And indeed, I've worked with some organizations and I've seen every single leader move on, but the culture go marching on. The culture resides not in the people, but in the connections, in the way the identity of the organization as it manifests in connections internally and externally. And we'll look a bit about how, how are those driven and kept alive. So we talk about these five levels. Only two of them are, are, are seeable and available on the surface. That's the artifacts of the organization and the patterns of behavior that people engage in. Then we'll look at some of the mindsets and assumptions um, that are driving those patterns of behavior. And what's going on in the emotional ground that's creating the mindsets and the assumptions that's driving the behaviors. And right at the bottom, the motivational roots. And we put the fish in there because one of our favorite quotes is a Chinese proverb, which I think aptly describes culture. It says, the last one to know about the sea is the fish, because the fish is swimming in the sea all the time, and you don't notice that which you are immersed in. Indeed, another of my favorite quotes, uh, not just because it's from one of my own books, but one of my favorite quotes on culture is, culture is what you stop noticing in your organization when you've worked there for three months because it becomes part of your way of seeing, part of your way of responding. It becomes embedded in you as the organization becomes part of you and you become part of the organization. So let's just look at these five levels in a bit more detail. And um, I, I've chosen some images so that we can think a bit about the British culture, both those of you who are immersed within it and those of you who are outside of it. And perhaps I'll give some examples from um, a, a client I worked with very early on in my days with organizational culture, which was um, British Aerospace, just at a point in the 1980s when they were about to be thrown out of the Airbus consortium. So level one is the artifacts. These are the mission statements, the value statements, the, uh, the things you see on the wall, what's in the waiting room. The, the logo of the organization, the dress code, the objects that are displayed. So in Britain, you might think about the trooping of the colors, Big Ben, um, the, uh, the Queen. These are artifacts of our culture. In British aerospace, when I worked there in the 1980s, I was very struck that uh, when I went round the organization and I was given a great tour, what I noticed in every office, there were pictures and models of planes, but no pictures of people. And if we go to the next level, which is the patterns of behavior, these are the, the repeated ways that people perform. What I noticed at British Aerospace when I went round is that in my tour, we passed about 300 people that I was not introduced to. They just said hi as they walked past, but I did not pass one aeroplane that I wasn't lovingly introduced to with enormous sense of feeling and pride. So immediately we see that, that the pattern of behavior and the artifacts here are in alignment, not always. Another thing I noticed at British Aerospace was um, when I had meetings, and somebody came to the door, if they were from a lower rank, and the rank was the word that was used in those days, they would knock and wait. If they were at the same level, they would open the door and put their head around and say, are you free? Oh, I see someone's with you. But if they were from a superior rank, they wouldn't knock or put their head around the door. They would walk straight in, sit down and start a new conversation without even finding out who I was. So, so now we see what we're looking for is not individual behaviors, but what is the pattern that somehow that's in the, in the tissue and connectivity of the organization. 
The third level is the mindset. This is habitual ways of thinking, taking for granted assumptions, ways we look at things, what gets attention, what doesn't get attention. So to give the example from British Aerospace many years back, um, as a way of getting to the mindsets, which are very hard for people to see because they're part of their way of seeing, we asked them to come up with stories that exemplified the culture. We also, by the way, got them to come up with the unofficial induction program. Everything you need to know about the organization, but nobody tells you officially. And we got them to stage that, which started to surface some of the, the hidden aspects of the culture. And I remember to this day, one um, group came up with this story that everyone had heard about an electrician who on a test flight in British Aerospace saved the plane. So I asked these senior managers, I said, so what's the moral of the story? And they said, well, what, what do you mean? It's obvious, isn't it? You know, it's important to save the plane. So I said to them, how many people were on board? And nobody knew. Everyone knew the story, but nobody knew how many human lives had been saved, just that the plane was saved. And then I asked them what else it, it told them about the organization, introduced the notion of hero stories, fool stories, and villain stories. And they said, well, you know, this is the hero who saved the day. And then we explored it a bit further, and uh, suddenly, the, the second in charge of finance put his hand in his head and said, oh, now I realize. And I said, what, what do you realize? He said, I realize why February every year is a nightmare. And I said, tell me more. He said, well, in March, we hand out capital expenditure for the coming budget year. And in February, everyone creates a crisis to justify their application for investment in capital spend. And what we discovered together is this was a culture where if you asked to see the chief executive, you wouldn't get a reply. But if you created a crisis on the hangar floor, you got to see them immediately. It was a crisis-driven organization, which was, was loved getting out of, um, uh, uh, of difficult situations. I remember trying to do a strategy event with them with a senior team. And suddenly there was a knock on the door and somebody said, oh, there's a crisis on Hangar 2. And I was nearly knocked over as they took off their coats, rolled up their sleeves and headed heroically for the door to solve the crisis. So we see that, that, that in the culture, there are habituated ways, not just of behaving, but of seeing and perceiving and what gets attention. So if we look at the, uh, the mindsets of the UK, here's a, a Times newspaper headline from 1891, which read, Fog in Channel, Europe Cut Off. Now, some of you may realize that uh, that, that, that culture, poor Europe cut off from civilization, uh, it, it, may not have changed very much in the 130 years since that headline. That part of the whole fuel of Brexit is it, it, a deep mindset of people in the UK feeling they're not part of Europe. Europe starts at Calais. And indeed, this was something that we had to deal with in helping uh, British aer aerospace start to become part more fully and collaborative part of the European Airbus industry. The mindsets in turn are kept in place by the emotional ground, not what we do around here, but how we feel around here. What are the unprocessed reactions to major changes? What are the, the, the emotions that come from the work we do and how that impacts on the organization and if you like, infects the whole organizational being. It was clear when we were working with British Aerospace that to be an efficient modern organization, they didn't just need restructuring. 
They didn't need re-strategizing alone. What they needed was to deal with the fact that most of the organization was still in grief that they were no longer building Concord. They were assembling parts. They talked about fuselages as cocoa tins. They'd lost that sense of pride and meaning in what they believed was developing the finest aircraft that has ever been designed and engineered. They'd lost the, the, the religion that had held them together. And that grief had to be worked through in order for the organization to move on. And you could say that's true for a number of countries. You know, has Britain recovered from the loss of its status in the world, of feeling it was important? And that's true as I go to other places like um, Turkey. That great sense of, you know, we, were, we had a great pride in our past, but we don't have a sense of purpose for our future. And how do we work with that at the emotional level, but also at the motivational roots, collective purpose level? What is heartfelt around here? What is it we care about? How do we find a new sense of purpose as our role in the world changes? And we would argue that uh, if we look at all five levels of this, what's really important, you know, if we want to get real transformation, is that we're, we're, we're attending to all five of those levels and the connections between them. Because sometimes there's change at one level, but not at another. You know, the same would be true if we're working with trying to overcome sexism or, or racism in the organization. How do we help um, that organization not just shift what people do in their behaviors, but the mindsets and the emotional ground and the motivational roots that are keeping those patterns in place. And indeed, one of the things we often say is if you really want to shift a culture, what's important is not just to shift the people who are the, the, the embodiment of the old culture, but the bystanders who are allowing that old culture to still get practice and reside throughout the system. So let me just, before we take a break, get some of your questions in. Here's a list I put together of the top 10 mistakes, most common mistakes we have experienced in culture change. And it's amazing how many still we see happening in organizations. And you could say that each of these top common mistakes that when we first start to try and change or develop culture, often our first attempts in an organization won't work because the way we're trying to change the culture is a symptom of the deeper culture that we have not yet noticed. So one of our maxims about culture change is that often it's the second cycle of culture change that creates the first step forward. The first cycle just helps us realize some of the deeper levels of culture embedment. So we're going to ask you, please, please put into the box, which of those do you kind of recognize in organizations that you work for? or you're working with currently as a consultant or coach or ones you notice in your uh, in the university where you work or in the NHS, which of those? Just put your name and which numbers um, do you see and then they will address those a bit in some of the questions. And any questions you have about any of the 10 that are up there? Any of those that you think, well, that doesn't look like a mistake to me. That looks sensible. So please, in the chat box, and, and send it to all attendees, not just to the panelists, if you can. So I see from Janine, one, five, nine, and 10. Tracy has said one, two, and 10. Um, ah, Tracy said, can't say to all. Monica, um, one, four, and five. Oh, Liz Gould, all of them. <laughs> 
Fabian, one, eight, and ten. Great, Chris. Let, let's look at any kind of questions that have come in. Do, do put any questions in as well, and I'll just take questions on the first half before we go into a little bit more about, well, how do you make the change happen? So I've not seen uh, as many questions come in yet, uh, Peter. Um, I don't know if people have got any uh, questions. Oh, here you go. Here's one. Um, does a company always need to focus its attention on creating one culture? Often there are pockets of culture to navigate within an organization. Um, and I'd be, inter I'd be interested to make, to make sense to nurture different cultures uh, within one organization. Or is it one universal thing? Yeah, this is a classic um, question. Um, if I got paid a dollar for every time we kind of battled with this one, I'd be a rich man. Um, the, the, if you think, I think one of the best analogies is if you say that organizational culture is, is the organizational identity and you use individual identity as a metaphor, you can say we, we all have many kind of sub-personalities and different identities. The identity I have when I'm working with a client is different from the identity I have when I'm um, lecturing as a professor, which is different from the identity I have um, when I'm going off and working, sharing a business in South Africa. We, you know, a different identity when, when I'm with my wife and when I'm with my grandchildren. But yet, what we're looking for is each of those has, has its own kind of culture and its own way of being. But there's also a pattern that connects those. So culture is both um, multifarious and if it's a healthy culture, the whole is more than the subcultures. So you don't want to collapse all the, the subcultures into one unity of being because that would be over rigid. But you also want to look at how do we get congruence between the, the, the many different sorts of cultures we have within us. And, 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 and that overall culture isn't something that is, is, is kind of uh, limiting those subcultures, but it's about the way they connect and interact with each other. It's in the connections. So I think one of the things we have to do to help people work with culture is to, to, to not look at the parts, but to look at the connections the internal connections and the external. A long, a long question, a long answer, I mean, to a short question, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, uh, the, the, the one question that's come in so far. Um, I guess uh, one of the thoughts that's in my mind, Peter, maybe before we move into the sort of how do we uh, work on it is, uh, in your experience, what are some of the best ways of trying to understand the current culture? Um, you know, and what you might be needed in the future, because I think very often, uh, I know I see, you know, the kind of tick box questionnaires and so on. Any thoughts from you on the best ways of trying to understand the current culture? Yes, well, perhaps we should also send out a little paper we, we did oh, about uh, 10 years ago called uh, 10 Tra this little paper called uh, 10 Limiting Line Mindsets About Organizational Culture. And, and, and one of them is uh, rather rudely says, the problem with organizational culture questionnaires is cultures don't fill in questionnaires, only individuals. That doesn't mean that the questionnaires can't be useful sometimes, but if what I'm saying is that the culture resides in the connections and in that which we're not noticing, that the, the unthought known we sometimes talk about, the unthought known of a culture, that which we know in our guts, but we cannot articulate, then we have to have other ways of surfacing it. And that's why we, over the years, in GP Strategies and before that in Bath Consultancy Group, developed a, a, what we call the flying fish methodologies. How do we help people um, get above the sea they're swimming in and see the patterns within it? I've already talked about using storytelling. Um, we've used pictures, we've used um, enactments, um, ways of exposing. Uh, how do we use, one of the questions I often ask is how many of you get people who join your organization to be culture spotters? That is in their first three months to, to feedback what surprised them 
about what they've discovered working here that they didn't expect? What's impressed them? What shocked them? Because often it, it's the new recruits, it's the visitors that are our best uh, canaries that can alert us to what's going on in the culture that we're no longer noticing and uh, aware of. Okay, so Peter, a couple of other quick questions. So one is uh, in this slide here, you uh, start um, numbers uh, two and three with the word just. So just change the competency framework or just restructure the cult the organization. Um, do you mean that these would, uh, would not be valid parts of supporting culture change or just that they're not sufficient by themselves to change a culture? <laughs> um. I, I put the just in there because uh, I keep getting feedback that I'm being too radical and too rude, um, and, and, and that creates resistance. I, I think one of the important things is not to see that as the silver bullet, not to believe by restructuring the organization you're going to shift the culture. Yeah, The danger yeah. is we put old wine in new bottles. Yeah. The old phrase, we move the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, and the problem with restructuring is that everyone, when we've got a restructure going on, keeps their heads down, um, avoids being challenging because they're worried about where they're going to be relocated. And so that, that there's a freezing of the organization while we're doing it. So you know, there are places for restructuring, but I would say think about the culture before you do it and while you're doing it and after you do it, not wait till it's happened and then try and attend to the culture. Yeah, I think that's Another right. thing about the problem with competency frameworks is that, uh, that, that they're often developed based on what made yesterday's leaders successful, not competency frameworks in, which are also about capabilities and capacities that we need in order to meet future stakeholder needs and challenges. So if we are going to do leadership frameworks, let's at least make them based on what does the world of tomorrow need um, and what is the outside telling us about our, our culture and, and to be aware that, that, that learning new competencies does not shift culture learning new ways of connecting between us yeah so you know it would be lovely if in, in five years time rather than individualized leadership competencies we had new capacities that we collectively need in our leadership culture mm. that would be a different way of thinking very good uh, there's another question here, Peter, which may lead us into perhaps the, the next phase of the uh, of the session, which is uh, where's the best starting point for culture change? Right. Thank you, Vivian, for that question. <laughs> so let me, um, and I'm very struck by, thank you for the feedback, everyone. I'm really struck by how number one is the one that's come up most of the time. Mm. Let me say something about that before I go on to the question you've just posed, Chris. Okay. Um, as soon as you make culture a separate item, um, uh, you make it a silo of the change activity, a thing we're doing to the side, not something that's linked to our strategy, linked to our purpose, linked to our leadership development, you run into problems, right? And, and over and over again, I see, you know, strategy departments go off and developing strategy. HR been asked to do something about the culture. Uh, the, 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 the learning development department to go and get people into do leadership development, and they become siloed activities. And people wonder why they don't produce the change that's hoped for. You know, I'm arguing that in five years' time, we cannot afford to have separate strategy departments, HR departments, OD learning development we need one function and i'm calling that the future fit function the part of the organization is constantly helping the organization learn evolve and develop to be fit for tomorrow's future and so i'm i'm constantly wanting to break down the walls and, and and culture needs to be owned by everyone on the top team not 
shuffled into a corner with the HR director. So there you are. That's my sermon. Um, okay. Let me go on. The, the, we've the, got some more. We've got some more questions, but I suggest we pick them up uh, towards the end. And yeah, uh, yeah we, we will come, come back there. to them. I will yeah. leave some time to come back to them. So, so let's look at some of the points of leverage. The other question that that I would be a rich man if if I got paid regularly for is, should we do culture change top down or bottom up? Right. And as many of you will know, I um, I am very quick at spotting either or polarities believing that both solutions are wrong. You cannot cascade a new culture from the top. You cannot create a new culture by trying to coach everyone one person at a time. Every part of the organization has a point of leverage and a role to play. You cannot just change culture from the outside in, you can't go and say who's the best in our field and how can we import their culture. But you could also not just change it inside out, because if the last one to to know about the sea is the fish, we can't see the culture that we need to change, and our ways of changing will be symptoms of the culture. So what we argue is that actually it's really important for everyone on the top team to recognise the centrality of culture in managing our organizational development and transformation. The top have to be able to articulate the challenge, to articulate what the future and the stakeholders need. And then they have to have a way of orchestrating and engaging other parts of the system to become part of, first of all, discovering what aspects of our culture help that change what might get in the way of it, um, what do we need to hold on to, what do we need to let go of, and, and what's missing that we need to introduce, the classic three-way sort. But often that question should be top down and bottom up. We miss what we call the middles join up. Barry Oshry says that often, you know, it's the, the, the top who are there to set the challenge, the bottom are there to, to, to be the engine of the organization, but the role of the people in the middle is to create integration across the organization. Many middle leaders and managers often say to me, oh, well, nothing will change around here until you change the culture of them at the top, pointing upwards. And my response is often to say, why do you think the people at the top of the organization who got there because they were successful at playing yesterday's game are going to be the people who create tomorrow's game. Also, we have to mobilize the middles because it's those middles, if they stop being stuck running between the people above them and the people beneath them, but can actually join up across functions, across countries, across regions, who can often see some of the patterns and the connections and it's often the middles who are the leaders of tomorrow who need to be creating the culture of tomorrow. So we do need to involve everyone, not just cascade it down on them. We do need a bottom-up approach. We need a middles join up and a top down, but the top down needs to be not cascading the answers, but articulating the challenges, giving encouragement and, and, and inviting the change process and finding ways of orchestrating it. And the same with the outside in, inside out. We do need to, if you like, have some sort of partnership between the people inside who have to evolve the culture, but to bring in people from outside to wake us up to what we're not seeing. This can be sometimes consultants or coaches or um, professional help. It could also be how do we invite in our customers, our investors, our partner organizations, and, and carefully orchestrate how they can help us see how what we're not seeing and how we need to evolve. So I hope that answers some of those questions. Where, where are the leverage points? And just remember that 
if culture resides not in the parts and not in the people, but in the connections, then what we need to do with all, all coaches and all consultants is to help them stop coaching individuals and consulting to parts and to start to coach and consult to connections. I had a CEO in the research I did on tomorrow's leadership say to me, Peter, I've got lots of coaches who consult, who coach to my people, lots of consultants who consult to parts of my organization, but that's not where the challenge is. All my challenges, he said, lie in the connections, the connections between people, between functions, between teams. And that's where I need the help, but that's where it's hard to find the help. And, and another good colleague of mine said, look, you know, we used to think that uh, changing culture and uh, coaching people was about changing what happened between people's ears. Now I realize it's not about changing what happens between people's ears. It's about changing what happens between people's noses. The spaces between us. The spaces between functions. The spaces between the organization and its stakeholders. So, you know, how do we, does GP work? Um, and before that, Bar Consultancy Group. Um, so first of all, you cannot have a set methodology. We have to create a partnership between the outsiders and the insiders, between the tops, the middles, the bottoms. Uh, we do have um, not only um, models, but a number of methodologies where we would get groups from across the organization to take part and becoming the flying fish. We have to also look at what's the gap. You know, there's no such thing as a bad culture and a good culture. What we're interested in is the gap between how is the culture that we've got at the moment helping us deliver the strategy that the world of tomorrow and our stakeholders need? And what needs to shift in that? And how do we orchestrate that engagement but right across the organization. So that that whole way of, uh, of um, architecting that process is, is one of the things we believe. We, we, believe. we don't, as, as consultants, come in with the answers or a sense that this is the culture you need, but the architecture for engaging many parts of the system inside and outside to be part of that process. And, and I'll give you one example of, uh, of doing that, and um, then I'll invite Chris to, to give you another couple of examples. So, so the first one is uh, quite recently we've been working with um, uh, two, uh, a large merger, and this is where culture becomes really critical. And we were invited in to uh, this in the finance sector to, to help these two financial organizations look at how did they merge their, merge their cultures? And they said, look, what we want to help in is how, how do we have a culture change effort that, that creates the, uh, a culture that's the best of both? Now just pause there. Because in that request was a symptom of the cultural issue. Because if we had engaged as consultants in helping them develop the best of both, given this was investment management, what would have very quickly happened is there would have been great competitions about who had the best IT platform, who had the best HR, who had the best systems for this, who had the best aspects of that. And what we would have created is not a new organization, but a competition field. So our first intervention was to say, look, I think this is the wrong frame you're asking us to engage with. What we're interested in is what is the organization that together we could give birth to that doesn't yet exist, that the world of tomorrow needs. So again, we are driving culture change, not from problem or situation, but we're driving it future back outside in and from purpose. What is the organization that's needed in our sector that neither of us could have created by ourselves, but the world is calling out for? And then we can ask, so how do we need to come together in order to give birth to that third organization? 
So hopefully that, that just gives you a, a new way of thinking about how do you do culture change? Because of course they wanted us to, to run all sorts of questionnaires on the two different cultures, do an analysis, do a power pack slide presentation of the two and, and, and tell them how they could be engineered together. But you can see how that very way, that mindset that was behind their request was the real culture that we had to, to 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 help them recognize and move on from. Again, do keep putting questions in. As I invite Chris just to give the uh, the second example. Thank you, Peter. Um, so uh, yeah, an interesting example. Which uh, when I look at the slide, I always have that sense of yeah, it it ended up like this, but it didn't start like this. So there was a a real sense of. Um, uh, an organization is a global business, uh, business to business uh, focus uh, had grown rapidly through acquisition. And it was really looking at how do we integrate these different businesses? How do we become one? So that we're, we're you know, the, the classic, you know, we want to be one united organization. Um, and, and we started with them uh, at, at the level of, well, let's work with the executive team and do some work and, and coaching for the executive team to help them think through what do they need to be doing differently and how do they embrace this challenge. And to help them do that, let's talk to some of the key stake stakeholders around them, both inside the business uh, and outside of the organization uh, in terms of uh, you know, clients and, and customers and partners and, and so on. Um, and, uh, and one of the key things I identified was a, a need to keep some of the key talent that had come through the acquisitions and that they were in danger of, uh, uh, of losing. So working alongside them through time, and, and I think that's key here because it wasn't a sort of a, here's your plan from the beginning, we know exactly what we're all going to do. It's something that emerged through time in terms of the, the, the needs emerging and how we might work with them. And what we worked with then was a sort of a leadership program, which that executive team took the lead on, and we coached them to a large extent in doing it. Uh, so it was much more about them bringing people on the journey at that next layer down. And you know, it involved a classic mix of you know understanding the current situation, looking at where they needed to be going forward, some action learning groups. And they were focused around the key projects. And what we were looking at was people taking on some of the projects which were part of their work, part of what needed to happen to grow and develop the business and integrate it, but helping them to see that and look at it through the lens of, well, how is this helping to build that one culture, one way of working? And how can I go about it in a way which is engaging and connecting and looking at the relationships between different functions and so on, rather than simply seeing it as a task that needs to get done and I push through regardless. Because they were engineers by background and training. They were sort of very good at sort of getting on and, and delivering projects. Uh, but how they did that needed to be part of the, uh, of the process. Um, and so we then went through various iterations to uh, to drive that forward and really help to build that, create a, a sense of one, one culture so that they've moved on a long way from, from where they started. So that's can, I, can I just link that back, Chris, to this notion, because just to, to add a little bit of color, this notion of the one culture, mm. um, I think given the question we had earlier, there is something about how do we talk about the, the, the integrated culture, which is more than the sum of its parts. Yeah? Yeah. So we don't have that sense that, that we're all being straightjacketed into a unified approach, whatever country we're in. Because I think it, otherwise we get caught in that old chestnut about centralization, decentralization. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and part of the journey here was involving people in that process. So in a sense, they were making sense of it together and with each other and, and so on. And it wasn't about the straitjacket. And, and there was a sense of people being engaged in the journey so that they felt they were helping to create what they needed to, to have in place going forward. It wasn't a question of the top team saying, right, here's the culture we need. Now you guys have got to go and do it, which, uh, again, I see very often. Um, and, so, and, yeah. and I partly said that because it links to a couple of questions that came in. Uh, mm -hmm. around agility and um, yeah. innovation. And and I think one of the things we've got to see culture not as a place of arriving, but a place of constant um, adapting, innovating agility. And if, if that's why we have to have multiplicity of cultures so that, that there are experiments at different parts of our system which are feeding into the overall. They're not split off. It's got a standalone startups. 
so that we've got that that dance between the, 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 the many parts that are constantly adapting to their local reality and how does that feed into a coherent whole yeah and the other thing i just want to pick out out from your case chris was um just, just to underline it is we talk about the leadership program we, we do a lot with organizations about helping them stop doing leader development programs and how that develops into leadership programs where we, we are if you like not only developing the leaders but the spaces between them and then how does that become the leadership program that you operate in become a leadership culture development program mm -hmm. in line with the organizational culture program just not to line that kind of link from what we said earlier yeah, and and I think the uh, and somebody's asked a question about uh, you know emergent approaches to culture change and 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 my experience is in fact we took one side out of this which was uh, quite complex to try and work through but actually it was trying to capture that sense of emerging change um, uh, and which is there uh, if we move on to the next example Peter I'm also aware of our time uh, uh, sliding by well, um, well, go on um, I'm wondering whether we should uh, oh what's happened here uh, it's the wrong button. Ah, there you go. Do I um, take that smaller? Um, so, uh, and this example, uh, again, we we worked with an organization, did working with an organization who started in a place where they had already done, done a lot of work and used a particular methodology to work out sort of where they are now and, and where they needed to be going forward. Um, and what they wanted to do very much was to engage the uh, the markets, the business across the world in doing things differently. Uh, and it's a fundamental change to the business, uh, different technologies, different ways of connecting to the marketplace, uh, different sets of relationships with regulators and so on. It's a, it's a massive long-term change journey for this business. Um, and, uh, and what they wanted us to do was to work with the leadership teams around the world uh, to help you know, sort of connect what has been decided at an overall strategic level then needs to play out in the local marketplaces. Um, and, and one of the key things in here that was, you know, emerged through the process was, of course, cascading that down, which is, is part of what we were looking to do there, is fine, but you also need to have that, that loop back to say, well, that's fine, and this is how it's working here, and this is what we're experiencing here, and this is how we are seeing things differently and creating a different kind of dialogue which was in itself part of the culture change between the sort of corporate center and the different businesses that are out there around the world um, because it's historically had a bit of a sort of a top-down you know directive culture and so there was an element of starting from where they were which was working with that but also helping to look to break that pattern as we were working with the businesses out and about around the world and then looking at helping the center to see their role differently uh, going forward with this as well. Uh, it's a continuing process. We're not there yet. Um, some bumps along the way, but uh, but an interesting uh, experience. That's great, Chris. Um, in terms of time, because we've only got four minutes left. Yeah. Um, I I won't go into this one. It's partly written up in some of my books. Um, mm -hmm. But but we wanted to bring in one from the, the 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 public sector. But I just wanted to also link back what you've said. I'll leave that on the screen for those who want to see it but some of the questions that have come in yeah which link to this so um so your last example of how do you work with something that's trying to roll something out globally that is top down how do you build into that the agility which says look can we can we get the top team to set the challenge and to orchestrate the process but can we also build in a feedback loop that says look what we want to discover from you is um, ways this, this might be applied in work in different parts of the world. Tell us where it doesn't work and what are the difficulties you run into, but also feed that back in a way that can help us in the second cycle realize the limitations of our thinking in the first cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think that process is critical. And we're doing that not only inside the organization, but we're doing that in partnership with our stakeholders. And I think that um, that that process, if you take away nothing else, is really important. And I wanted to link that to a question that came in, Chris, from Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, my question is based on the fact that partnerships, this is a, a, a legal partnership, 
are made up of partners brought in from various firms and trying to merge the cultures and behaviors. You see, it, it comes back to this, this whole notion that I was saying with the first example, Tracy, that rather than ask how do we merge the culture for this bit that's come in and that bit that's come in, how do we together value our diversity and say, what does that allow us to do that none of us could have done if we'd stayed separate? So on the previous webinar about purpose-driven organizations, I came up with this phrase from one of my blogs which said, partnerships are not created by partners. It's the purpose that creates the partnership, not the partners. And that, if you see that applying to your law firm or applying to that financial merger, actually it's not the best of both, or how do we take a bit from you and a bit from us? It's about what is it we can do together that we cannot do either apart or by working in parallel? What is it that, because identity is, is not just created from within, it's created from the dynamic relationship of of, of, of all the richness um, and resources that, that, that the organization has in dynamic relationship to what the world out there is needing and wanting. And it's in that co-evolution that culture change happens. Mm -hmm. um, we've got about one minute left, so let me just, um, some headlines. Culture each our strategy for breakfast. Culture does not just exist in the behaviors. Uh, it can be diagnosed and understood, but not managed top down. We can work with the top down. It's very hard for them to see the culture because of their position in the system. Uh, we can help them see the system and we can help do an inquiry process. Then we can partner with them on how do we orchestrate the change. Um, as the culture starts to shift, it will find ways to resist or rebound. One of the really important ones I said earlier is how do we avoid this notion? Um, I remember the biggest mistake I ever made in culture change was putting something up which said, a slide which said culture from to, right? And immediately all the people who'd worked there and spent you know, a good part of their lives dedicated to this company felt they were now being told they were part of yesterday's culture, that what they were doing was wrong. And they all now had to join this new, this new movement forward. And what we have to realize is culture isn't good or bad. It's either fit for its context or not fitting its context. Yesterday's culture was probably the right culture to deliver to yesterday's world. What we have to evolve to is what's the culture that's needed to deliver to tomorrow's world. So, that's just a little summary. And just to say for all of those of you who are in leadership development, a simple model that will send you with a slide which says, now how do we help leaders and leadership become aware of the culture they are being and work collectively, not just as individuals, but shift to the culture they want to be creating? And that's a key aspect of, of the leadership journey. There are some references. We've probably got time for two more questions before we have to leave. <laughs> Stretching the boundaries. Um, we have one question from a, a future company perspective. Maybe you've just touched on that a little bit. What do you imagine will be the biggest challenge organizations will have? Ah, well, um, do go, uh, either email me and I'll send you a copy of tomorrow's leadership and the necessary revolution in leadership development yeah um because in that we do talk about we did research right around the world and we looked at what were the seven big challenges for organizations and how did that require leadership collectively to shift its leadership culture to step up to those challenges there's quite a bit in that uh -huh. around those issues yeah we can maybe include the reference to it again in what we send out uh, afterwards and um, i just one last one was, was that with an aging population, mm -hmm. where do you see the main areas of culture change? I just wanted to, uh, Robert, just, just to end on that, which is to say, look, whatever your views are about um, what the UK are doing around Brexit or what Trump is doing in America around 
uh, making America great again. What we have to recognize in both those two bits of history is a failure because both Trump and those who voted to leave the European Union, the dominant people who, who, who voted to leave were the people over 60. But the people who wanted to remain as part of Europe were the people under 30. That's a great exaggeration, but there's a big time age gap. And that's because we failed on the larger cultural stage to help the culture of our two countries cope with the culture change that was necessary to move into a globalized world. So culture change is not just something we do for, for organizations, small and big. It's something we need to think about in terms of the, the world stage. Our failure to deal with the ecological crisis is because we haven't evolved our human culture to live in one globalized, integrated ecological niche with three times more people than when I was born living on this earth in a way that can cope with the environment not being something separate from us. And, and that is an enormous challenge. So I hope whatever we share today helps you think about your local issues as well as the global issues. And thank you very much for joining. And if you've got other questions, do email them in. Yeah, please do. Um, thank you, Peter, for your time and your thoughts and your wisdom. Uh, appreciate it as ever. I'm aware that there are some questions that we maybe haven't answered uh, as directly as we might. What we'll do is, uh, is capture all of those and uh, in what we send out, we'll send out the slides and the recording of the session and we'll send out some uh, responses to those questions as well so that people can see uh, you know, some thinking around that. And if you do want to get in touch with us, again, the details will be in the, uh, in the deck and so on that we send. Uh, I know Peter will be happy to answer any, any specific questions. Um, and we will be running some more of these webinars uh, going forward, so we'll be sending out the details around those as well. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the questions and the engagement. Really appreciate it. It's been a fantastic session, Peter. Thank you. And uh, look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Goodbye for now.